So, uh, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so it's very nice that you all made it here. Uh, you made it through the conference and the exhibition. It's been uh, some busy days. So yeah, so we're here to discuss about skilled labor shortage. So a uh, short introduction to myself. So I'm going to moderate this, this panel. So my name is Jeronimo Castellón. I'm a professor at TU Dresden in, in Germany. I work on programming languages and compilers, so nothing to do with a skilled labor shortage or talent a a acquisition. Uh, only that um, I was also involved in a startup, and in the startup, and also in the in my role as a professor, I do feel the short shortage of talent and how difficult it is to attract talent. So we're going to be talking about this um, with uh, three panelists. So they are going to be all the talking. I'm I'm, the, I'm just the moderator. Uh, so let me introduce the panelists to you. So we have, uh, I'll start on this side. So we, we have Adriana Gogonel. So she's a, the CEO of Staff Inf, Stat Inf. So that's a startup. Uh, so that we're going to get uh, perspective from startup situations. Um, so Adriana uh, has a PhD in statistics from the University of Paris de Scouts. Uh, she spent then six years at INRIA in a postdoctoral position. Um, and then she actually grounded, so this was, you, you've grounded this with Liliana, who was your advisor, right? Or, uh, so, um, so yeah, that's a very typical story of a startup coming out of academia. Uh, so Staff Inf um, has now 11 people, engineers, uh, PhD people, um, and they propose software tools and services for time verification of real-time embedded systems. So on the middle we have uh, Magdalena Daxenberger. So she is marketing innovation manager at DH Electronics. So they actually have a booth, and, and this is from them. Um, so Magdalena is uh, an electrical, electrical engineer by passion and also a passionate entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. She, she's also a, a so she also had a startup. Uh, so as a career, so she's a marketing innovation manager, as I said, in DH Electronics. She was a founder of. Inno Shimgao, maybe you will correct that in a minute because I saw different names uh, there. Uh, she has a Master of Engineering in Management and Engineering from the Rosenheim Technical University of Applied Sciences and a Bachelor of Engineering from the Baden-Württemberg Corporate State University. So she um, enjoys working with creative ideas. She, she enjoys working collectively with people. Um, she, she likes learning by doing, and so maybe she's going to tell us a little bit about that. And um, her goal is to uh, run a uh, run her, her own business and see that uh, see that see, see that grow. Uh, and the last panelist that we have here is Alexander Graye. He's a, the lead of a talent attraction team at Infineon Technologies. He's uh, in Munich. Um, he started his career in head hunting, so I think he has a lot of insight in how to hunt heads, how to uh, get talent to companies. He works in recruiting and active, uh, and active sourcing and is responsible for the team attraction um, in the headquarters in Munich. So his ex experience in tech recruiting, talent marketing, uh, support and advice and hiring managers, and successfully filling positions in the competitive engineer and IT talent market. So those are our panelists. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, the shortage of talent and um, so I think this is something, I mean, if you came here, it's because you, you suffered through this pain, right? And this is something that is really a, a big issue worldwide. Um, so as you saw in the description of this panel, uh, I was shocked to see that, for instance, in Germany, uh, the amount of engineers that are leaving the workforce and the demand, so that creates a demand, and, and new jobs are created also a demand because of multiple trends that we're going to hear in a minute. And so basically, uh, Due to people leaving the workforce and the demand for new engineers, in Germany, uh, we need twice as many engineers than the universities are producing. So no wonder we don't find people to fill our positions. So a lot of trends uh, behind this, and I think Alexander is going to tell us about this. Um, and so the interesting part of this of this panel is that we're going to hear different perspectives from from people in big uh, corporations, big industries, but also in startups and also in a family company in Germany. So without further ado, I'm, I'm happy to open this panel. So the panelists will start with an opening statement, um, and then 
we'll take it from there. We discuss the we will discuss the issues that they that tra that they raise. I'll be happy to take questions from the audience as well. So if you have questions for the panelists, of course, just no doubt in raising your hand. Okay, so let's start with Adriana. Oh, we're Magdalena. Yeah. So we changed. Uh, oh, well, we decided that way. Yeah. Works already. Right. Yeah, now it does. Yeah. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Magdalena, and as you might have heard, I have various roles. Uh, first and foremost, I am the marketing and innovation manager in the family business, DH Electronics. We do de we do develop embedded systems, uh, hardware and software side. And we are around 40 people, and 25 of them work in the R&D department. So as you might guess, we need a lot of engineers. And um, yeah, to be honest, <coughs> sorry, we are in a quite rural area, and we have a lot of bigger companies around us. So of course, there's sort of a competition to, of course, attract the most talented people to our company, and of course, every other company has the same goal. So talking about skilled labor shortage, I think that we have to see it as a chance. Of course, it is a challenge, but we try to give it an entrepreneurial approach and to, sol to solve that problem. And what we see is that people are really much looking for what values does a company have. We are family business, we know each other. Uh, in German, we say uh, do and not see uh, what is like the little things that uh, are already part of a corporate culture. And also the company values become more and more important. I think especially the younger generation is really thinking about what sort of company they want to work for and what colleagues they want to work with. Is it like a diverse workforce? Are the values in the company really lived in every day? Or is it just like a few sentences on any banner that guys see when they walk through the company randomly but do not really feel whenever they are in a meeting? And these are things that we really take care of. We really want to live to our values. And uh, we also want to hire people that fit in that value-based approach that we live. And also, maybe you won't find the person with the perfect skill set. But if the mindset is like a growth mindset, and if that person is keen to learn, then maybe you do not need someone who can take like 100% of the job at. But if it is a person that is keen to learn, we can also try to develop that person and that talent further. And so attract talent that maybe would not have got that specific job at another company because they're not at 100%. Uh, but we can give them the opportunity to grow within our organization. So this is uh, only a few insights on what we do at DH Electronics. Then, of course, I have an other role because I'm one of the very few women in the embedded industry. So I did informatics in school. Uh, I studied electrical engineering in my bachelor's, and uh, I worked for a company because I did like a dual study program. I was like the only woman in the sensorics group as well. And I think also when you walk through the halls here, you'll see still very few women, and so still a lot of talent which is not brought to that industry. And uh, what I can tell is that uh, we have to work on that because there's a lot of potential um, to be uh, raised. And uh, yesterday we had the first networking event, which is, which is called Women for Embedded World. And uh, I can only engage you to take part in such initiatives as well. Uh, they will be there in the next few years. And third, I want to talk very shortly about my role as founder. Um, so, as I mentioned, I live in a quite rural area in the south of Germany, really close to the Alps. And there we have a lot of companies who suffer from skilled labor shortage because Munich is only like one hour commute away. So many people also want to commute to Munich because there they have like the really big companies. And uh, yeah, but we also have great companies who are like hidden champions very often. And they have 
not the maybe they have not all the benefits that like the really big players can list, but they are really open to take part in innovative formats such as the hackathons that I organize, which are events which are meant to just bring together talents who want to bring in their expertise in a specific topic. It's always with regard to sustainability and to also get the chance to get to know companies and the people in there, not only by going to their website or talking to them 10 minutes at a comp uh, as a university show, but they get to know each other a whole weekend long. And there you will learn a lot about what I said earlier, values, behavior, corporate culture and stuff like that. So this is what I do on, on third place. And I'm really curious to learn about what do the really big players do to attract talent and also, of course, what is going on in the startup world. Thank you. So it's um, easier to come second. <laughs> uh, uh, one of one of the things that um, I'm reasoning to uh, from uh, what Magdalena said is about uh, the values of the company. Uh, as a small, uh, very small company, we started three years ago. We are from the French, uh, from uh, from France, from uh, Paris area. So we are already uh, next to the huge uh, companies that are proposing uh, uh, attractive salaries and. Uh, um, but some way, uh, we are coming from academia. Uh, we are two uh, co-founders. Uh, my uh, associate is the direct, uh, research director at the uh, French Institute in um, Automatics and Informatics uh, in RIA. And um, uh, our challenge was uh, to, to become, a, to, to transform a prototype, uh, academical prototype into a commercial product. Uh, so we uh, needed uh, engineers for us to do that. Uh, the first engineer that joined the company were uh, junior profiles because it's a, a little bit what we could afford at the time. And, uh, and we were known in the research area and in the masters um, that are uh, in Paris area. So um, it was easy for us to, to have uh, human resource from this point of view. Um, we realized then that when a more senior profile joined, uh, that uh, um, the fact uh, that having uh, some junior at the beginning and uh, not uh, a senior one to to guide them, uh, it was a, a little uh, a lot of work to to be done, and we had like uh, two years old and already some technical uh, debt uh, to. Uh, uh, to improve uh, how, how the product was uh, was going to be uh, transformed. So, um, actually, the one thing that uh, I noticed is that uh, people coming uh, from a research um, uh, that uh, having uh, had a PhD was uh, much more humble into uh, their. Um, uh, the salary they are uh, proposing, even uh, they are uh, demanding, even uh, they will not um, dare to uh, to propose one. They are waiting for us uh, to to give a, a figure. But uh, people coming from industrial um, uh, path are uh, already very aware of uh, of the fact that uh, there are not a lot of. Uh, uh, engineer, skilled engineer, uh, and uh, they could have a very high salaries. So sometimes it's like, oh, wow, at 33, uh, we are asking for uh, 80,000 a uh, year. So um, I was thinking about myself, oh my God, when I f end, uh, when after my PhD, I, already, I had the, like 40, and I was, yes, finally I have uh, real money. <laughs> Um, the problem we have uh, us is that uh, af uh, actually what Statinf is doing is proposing a software uh, from a timi for timing analysis for the embedded system conceivers. And um, we put together statistical methods and uh, optimizing uh, uh, optimization uh, to do that. 
And actually, we would need the perfect guy for us it would be an uh, embedded system engineer who is developing like a beast and who knows uh, how statistics work. And this profile is very rare. So uh, uh, for the moment, uh, we, we tried uh, the three ways. We took somebody from statistics to teach him a little bit of embedded systems, so, uh, but who is uh, pretty good in, um, in coding. We took an embedded system engineer and uh, took him, uh, learned him some statistics, and, uh, and now we realize that we really do uh, need like a lead developer, the guys that really understand how this works, and, uh, and, uh, but has a little bit, and it will be easier for him to, to understand some embedded system and some statistics. Well, the guys in, in, in the house, that embedded systems profile we already have, do not agree. They think, uh, no, we do need another embedded system engineer who will know how to do a lead development. So um, I think this is, for, for us, this is the major challenge, uh, that we need a complex profile, and it's pretty rare. Uh, uh, to find. And, um, and the fact that uh, we do have uh, bigger companies that are proposing uh, attractive salary make us want to, to propose the same, but uh, we tried, as Magdalena was saying, uh, to back up with values uh, of the companies and the fact that uh, it's a small team, it's a human uh, uh, sized team, and, uh, and it's very nice to, to work in, and we listen to people bringing up uh, uh, new ideas and solutions. And uh, now we have a guy from a very uh, important company that wants to join. And for me, maybe he didn't, uh, it was like maybe he didn't have a permanent position. So I did ask, so when do you end your contract at this company? I do not end it, I have a permanent position. I said, oh, wow, and why do you, do you want to join us? Because I want to be listened. I want to, um, uh, I propose things. They took me because I have a, uh, like uh, the perfect uh, profile, but actually nobody listens to me. I do stuff like a uh, uh, basic engineer and uh, I, uh, I do not use what I know. So I, I really want to, to be part of something that is built now and that uh, I can say, yes, I was there when, um, when the product of Statinf was born. So uh, this is the, my point of view. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and with your, I leave you give the big company's point of view. Hello. Perfect. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. My name is Alexander Greyer. I'm leading a talent attraction team at Infineon Munich headquarter. And what do we do as a company? Maybe you don't know us. So we develop, design and produce um, these microcontrollers and chips. We are um, a company that is founded around about 20 years ago, former Siemens. And uh, we are big, a little bit bigger than <laughs> the other two companies. It's more than 55,000 employees worldwide. And we do have also a lot of uh, different challenges. It's not like this. And in my opening speech, I like to uh, firstly uh, cover and uh, outline some major drivers for this uh, increasing talent demand. And then secondly, I'd like to propose a short overview and a short uh, suggestion about how we, with ideas, how we can react and tackle this, this topic. So first of all, I guess everyone has heard about this. Um, it's all about digitalization and decarbonization. These are mega trends that um, face and um, tackle all the different industry and especially also in the semiconductor industry uh, where we are. And the semiconductor industry is also a key enabler for these mega trends. Um, saying that, um, maybe you have heard this also in the news, a lot of new uh, fabs and production sites are planned also here in Germany. For instance, at Infineon we are planning uh, to double size the production in Dresden with a Model 4. So this will be a giant project uh, that should be live in 2025. And then also other companies like Intel, yeah, they, they announced to set up a production site in Magdeburg or uh, Wolfspeed in Saarland. So the uh, high-tech and semiconductor area in Germany like really really growing and also 
Um, having said that, for instance, like Apple is also investing billion um, euros or dollars um, in the side of Munich. So it's a huge um, competitive environment. And this means a lot of companies now are growing yeah, and seeking for new employees. The third part is a completely different one. It's about demographic change. So we are facing the situation that um, I would say latest by 2030, a lot of um, baby boomers from this generation will retire. Yeah? So there will be a leakage yeah, of all the knowledge that will retire. And this situation we need also to handle with. And last but not least, um, one major thing is about the decreasing students in the electrical engineering or information technology environment. So that is also one point then I like to propose some suggestions about how we can deal with that topic. So in my opinion, we can only solve um, this problem about lacking labor shortage if all the relevant stakeholders um, work on the same page and also um, working with the same uh, target. This means starting with schools, universities, companies and also in the society. Um, at Infineon and also I guess a lot of different other companies are running so many initiatives based on a regional level, national wide or European wide level. Yeah? Networks, campaigns, but also competitions. And this needs to be harmonized to create some synergies. For instance, um, here it's mentioned Silicon Saxony. I recently uh, read an article about uh, that until or by 2030, there will be um, in the semiconductor area in, in Dresden, in this area, um, more than up to 100,000 jobs available. Uh, and that's really, really enormous. A number. And last but not least, we as an industry, we also have to contribute uh, to um, foster and to increase the talent flow. So what can this be? So first of all, to increase the STEM enthusiasm yeah, on school level. Yeah. Later on, we can have a, a short discussion on that. What could this be? Then, of course, I mean, for me, it's, it has been quite some years ago, but I still remember it. It was not so easy after um, obtaining my A-levels to know what I'm going to study or if I want to um, do a vocational education. So this is also one major thing we have to think about to provide a better professional orientation. A completely different thing is about the immigration. So at Infineon, we hire really globally. So not only regional, so we have um, our jobs are available in, on, on, on social media and on the intranet or on the websites. And we are really hiring globally from all over the globe. And this is also a key factor to really get the skilled labor force to, to Europe or to Germany. Next thing is about to foster the knowledge within the company. So for instance, we have some academies uh, in place at Infineon, um, for instance, automotive academy. So all new joiners participating in this academy, there's an onboarding plan that employees get upskilled to the level that they need to fulfill the jobs. But also in other industries like automotive industries from combustion engines, there's now the electric engines. Yeah? So these companies really need to reskill and upskill their workforce. And last but not least, we have to be a, an attractive um, employer with interesting benefits to be best in class. And this doesn't mean it's always good to be uh, a huge company. Uh, it's also um, not everyone wants to join this uh, huge company. So. Um, you need to be best in class huh, if you want to compare within the companies. Thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, we save the applause for the end and, and we get into, into some discussions and maybe we're going to stand on this side. Um, yeah, so 
so I think we've we've heard things that are maybe not at all unexpected, right? So things that like like things that we have to do in the short term, like for instance, how to attract talent. Since, for instance, in Germany or in France, um, I guess the, the the production of talent is lower than the demand for talent. So we heard about internationalization that we have to hire people from abroad. Um, so maybe what I want to touch upon those those maybe about that aspect first, right? Like how to solve the shortage in the short term. I guess now in, in industrial nations they have to look outside, and maybe I want to get the first impression of the challenges that come with that. And so I myself, I'm international and I have a small team, but there has nine nations in my team. And I know that it is challenging, but I want to know how uh, small companies, big companies deal with that. I'll take this for it first, because uh, we are 12 in the company and we have uh, six nations, <laughs> I think. So, um, Yes, it is very important not to limit uh, yourself uh, with the sex, uh, nationality that is more representative uh, in the place where you are. And uh, the fact that we did, uh, for example, for some of our uh, first engineers, I did the job to, ha to have them the work uh, papers after their studies. So uh, it is something that uh, uh, a big company won't do in France. <laughs> And um, uh, yes, it is important to, to, to be open because uh, uh, if you only look at the uh, French white guy at uh, his uh, 30s coming from uh, ENS, it's the most imp uh, famous uh, engineering school in, in France, uh, the resources are, uh, are limited. Uh, maybe what I can tell from our perspective, so so far, we have always had a lot of people living like in a radius of, let's say, 20 kilometers around uh, our company site. And for us, it's already really a success to have people working remotely from within any location in Germany. Also, we started to have hardware developers who work in the north of Germany, so they actually do not come very often to the office, and it works. To be honest, we were not sure if it does, but if you equip the people's uh, workplace very well, then it's really a good option to go for that as well. And when it really comes to working with international people, uh, we have really good experiences with uh, so not so many people who are really employed at DH Electronics, but who are employed at our partners, and like we have to work with them uh, very often. And what we see is that it's really cool to work with people from around the world, and that it also works if you're not in the same time zone. We have a software engineering partner. They are similar to you. They are like 15 people, all of them living in different countries. And for us, we are more on the side of, like, they feel like team members, of course. And uh, we learn a lot from that experience that we know, OK, we can handle that. We can work internationally. We can work remotely uh, with many people. And we now dare to really hire more international talent for our team as well. So that's uh, also a good uh, starting point, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that uh, you're already also um, very open for hiring um, non-speaking, non-German speaking employees. Because when I was, and non-French, yeah. <laughs> um, when I was starting my career like eight years ago, I was uh, always recruiting in the area of engineering and IT. And as you mentioned in the beginning, I was uh, working as uh, in a headhunting agency and was taking care about smaller, medium-sized, but also bigger companies in Bavaria. And I was delivering engineers. Yeah? And like 90% of them, yeah, the hiring managers, they were not accepting um, non-German speaking um, employees. This was like eight years back then. And I was like in my role, yeah, I was always emphasizing on, OK, it won't work out. Yeah? we won't find the right talents yeah, to fulfill also your profile. So um, after the years, and I think also during COVID, yeah, we have seen there needs to be more flexibility. 
And at Infineon, I was like really surprised in the beginning when I was starting like three years back there. Um, all the job ads, or like 90% of the job ads, are posted in English. So like that's the first part, you know, you really need to post not only in German, but also in English postings. Um, and this is like really one of the key factors that if the managers allows yeah, that the, the working language is English, yeah, um, this is a key factor to, to get the supply from, from talents all over the world. Yeah. And one thing you were mentioning about the flexibility and remote work is very interesting. Um, um, because of COVID, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we have now the situation that a lot of companies um, were forced yeah, to think about this. Yeah? It's not any more necessary to go into the office five days a week. For some jobs, of course, yeah? um, we don't sugarcoat this. Yeah? That's, that's true. But um, in the production side, of course, you have to go five days a week. Huh? Um, but for um, engineering jobs, yeah, like digital design, software jobs, um, hardware jobs, um, it's of course possible uh, to work like in a hybrid mode. And this would be also interesting maybe to discuss about the working culture, what, what is like the consequence of, about the working culture. Because now we are having kind of a hybrid modus, um, like 60-40% or 50-50 that we ensure also to get connected to the company and to the team. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, I, I just wanted to say that for uh, that uh, rumors in France says <laughs> that in Germany, I, I, uh, if you want to um, open up just um, you know a commercial point uh, with one engineer, and you have to have German speaker, you have to. Uh, hire German people if it won't work otherwise. Um, so, but uh, to come on uh, the remote thing, uh, yes, now uh, mm, we don't have, uh, we only have one employee that likes to go five days a week uh, in the offices. Uh, for, the, for the others, they are, uh, we, we did have uh, engineers that was their first job during COVID. Even their internship was doing uh, completely at home. And actually it was the, the only way they uh, they known as uh, 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 to work, and for uh, for them it it was two of them. It was very hard to make them come at the office to to show them that yeah, he, I actually we can communicate much simpler. We'll, it goes faster the the work if we we you come here. So now for us, for example, it's free office day and two um, uh, remote day for. Yeah. So, so I was going to I was going to ask a bit about about the flexibility aspect as well because I think that's so so I think you mentioned that as well like uh, people now come with very high requirements right because they there's talent shortage so they have kind of the the upper hand and so they want work life balance they want to work from home uh, four days a week. Uh, uh, and so especially for startups I think that's challenging right and to build to build um, also team uh, team spirit, so uh, I think you were alluding to that as well. That is, sure. I mean, it's it's good to be flexible, but there has to be a limit to that. And and, they, and I wanted to maybe poke you on that. So where do you draw the line, or or is it just yeah, everybody from home all the time and. and, and for us, no. We try to and we do. Uh, for example, one we have a daily visio. Uh, uh, we have weekly, uh, we wanted to make them uh, pre uh, in present. It, w it didn't work. Um, we have monthly. <laughs> yeah. Everybody at once uh, at the office. Uh, the weekly is from uh, everybody where he is, if it's in the office. Mm -hmm. or so um, uh, now people are not ready to come uh, if they don't work, as, uh, as you say, as a job where you have to be um, in the place. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a major one of them even says that I could never work uh, for for an employee that that uh, asked me to come five days a week. Maybe I can catch up on that because we now do not have a rule that says you have to come like two or three days to the office. So we have no rule at all at the moment, and we have people who literally never show up at the office, and we have people who are like 
oh my god, I can't be around my whole family and dogs and <laughs> household and stuff. I'll come to the office every day. And yes, it really is a challenge to make sure that the culture still exists and that yeah, colleagues get to know each other better and that there are strong bonds. And what we try to do is not, uh, not really force people to come to specific meetings, but to always offer opportunities like after work events, like team events, um, summer parties, stuff like that in a regular uh, order so that there's always an option where people uh, can go. And of course, they're asked to do so. But yeah, we, we try that way at the moment. I'm not saying that we will never change that. But uh, we have seen that people got used to working from home. And especially in the software department, there are people who say, I don't have any reason to come to the office to do my work. What is true, obviously. And then we have people who do not have that strong need for personal contact. So it's just a matter of personality as well. And this is really individual. And we try to meet the individual need of our team. Uh, but that often makes it uh, also complex. And you have to find like a solution for every single person. This is what we try to do right now. Uh, but of course, this gets harder with uh, more people that are asking for the perfect yeah, solution that, for their that, needs. That won't scale, yeah. Um, so, so, OK, so we're talking about like these short-term things. Like, OK, we, we need to be more flexible. We need to hire internationally. Uh, I think Alexander had a very nice quote in one of your emails that you hire for, for potential and train for skills. I really like that. And you also mentioned that as well. So you need a very special profile. So you try with the statistician and try to train for the rest of the skills. So I guess that's also a way out of, in, in the short term. Um, but yeah, so maybe you can comment on how do you recognize potential then? And, and how successful has this strategy be, uh, been in the, in the past? Um, so it's working? Yeah. Um, in the last years, you know, I was like really, really emphasizing on that topic. Because normally, when a manager or the hiring department is seeking for a new employee, only the hard facts are a matter. You know? They're really looking, OK, 10 years of experience in C++ yeah, or in digital design or verification or what on and so forth, so forth and so on. And my experience is it's important, very, very important, that also the soft skills really match. Because um, in the end, Everyone started in the school or kindergarten school at the university and obtained a lot of knowledge. Also in the company, yeah, we were all graduates yeah, starting from point zero. And we are smart humans, so everything can be learned, uh, in my opinion. And that's why I'm always uh, trying to emphasize on that. And we have seen this, that in the end, the manager was always coming to me and said, ah, Alexander, Ah, oh, you were right. Um, this guy was not like a 100% match, like we say in German, the Eierlegen, the Wollmichsau, but <laughs> like the 120% uh, profile. Yeah? It's extremely uh, difficult to uh, get this person on board. So it's better yeah, to hire someone um, with great potential from the soft skill side and then train them. Because you save also a lot of time. Yeah? In case you're seeking for an, uh, a new employee for one year, two years, three years, in that time you could could have uh, skilled up also the employees. And your question was about how do I recognize this? So there are um, different methods. Um, in the interview, you can ask some skill-based uh, situation questions, behavior questions. Yeah? Um, in the beginning, I'm always trying to find out what are like crucial situations for this person to fulfill this job um, perfectly. Yeah? So, for instance, if this person works in a sales department yeah, or in an R&D department, then this person maybe needs uh, a very good detail-oriented mindset. Yeah? Or in sales, you need to be very communicative. Yeah? 
And then based on that, you can ask some skill-based behavior questions um, during the interview process uh, mm -hmm. and to make sure or to ensure um, that this person brings the right mindset. I would say that uh, um, yeah, it's uh, during our uh, pro uh, interview process that uh, uh, the first thing is the human. Uh, <laughs> no factor. Yes, uh, if it is a, you can know immediately if it is a match or it isn't. Not that everybody is um, a copy paste in our <laughs> company. We are very different in different ways. But uh, um, you can feel if you can work with somebody from the beginning. We and uh, yeah, I did have someone who um, I didn't think it was a good match from the personality point of view. It was for an internship. Um, but it was a girl, so I said, okay, we don't have that many girls in this area, so we'll take her. Uh, and finally, I was very impressed. It was really uh, uh, a hard worker and uh, uh, very serious. Uh, this is what uh, scared me a little bit, because uh, during the interview, she was uh, really, like, uh, very serious, not a smile, not an... And I'm asking, oh my God, it's a robot or that. <laughs> and um, but then uh, I think it is an area where the technical skills you can see it right away. Actually, when our uh, uh, research uh, and development engineer or our software engineer will uh, talk to the um, the person uh, to be interviewed. Uh, Immediately, you can uh, know the level where she goes to and the project it wo uh, he worked or she uh, worked on. Uh, and um, uh, yes, but one one of the question I would have for you two is that um, uh, did you ever had the case where the issue was the salary for somebody not to join your company? Sure. <laughs> I mean. Uh, um, as, you got, uh, as you already mentioned, um, salary is, of course, one of the um, main aspects yeah, also to choose an employer. Um, in, during the interview process, of course, the person say, ah, it's maybe not the second or third thing that is important, but it needs to be at least the minimum that the person is satisfied with. Huh? So, of course, we have also rejections yeah, that uh, we, it, it doesn't match. And then normally what I do is um, I suggest that in the beginning of the process, yeah, the interviewing process, you have to be transparent, talk about at least the expectations, because otherwise you really waste a lot of times when you're running through two, three, four interview sessions, right. I'm spending a lot of hours together, then you really like to hire and then... Yes. Yes, there's, I think in every company, for every position, there's always kind of a, a range, yeah? um, a minimum, maximum. And then if it's within this one, um, you can continue the process. And what other countries do, for instance, in, in, in Austria, um, and I think there will be maybe also a new law in Europe huh, that uh, we have to disclose the salary range also mm. in the job ads. In the job yeah. ads. Mm. Yeah, so if... The because I would like to touch upon the long-term uh, mechanisms, right? So uh, things like hackathons that you like uh, so much, you can say a, bit, a little bit about that, and uh, things that are being done, like the Girls' Day. Uh, so this way of like motivating more people to come into STEM fields. And uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that, what, what your companies do, how you guys engage. Uh, but also, if, we, if, you know, yeah, if you know if there is already some... Uh, if we have some numbers on that, like, is, is it working? Do, do we get more people motivated? Do we get more people, do we, do we get more, yeah, uh, offspring in these areas? Um, I think if you look at numbers showing the percentage of women, for example, in engineering, um, engineering um, degrees, it's not really increasing. So I think in electrical enge engineering, it's around 7%. That is like the average amount of women in electrical engineering studies. And of course, I observe this uh, from time to time. And it's really slowly, slowly, slowly uh, increasing by like 0.1% per year. So this is why we really have to do something. And I think 
talking about the quota for female members in boards and stuff like that, this is also a good example that there did not happen that much in the last 20 or 30 years. So since we had the quote, there is something going on inside most companies because they have to. And I think just waiting for a time to, for example, bring more women to engineering fields or to bring, in general, more people into STEM subjects will not work. So we have to actively engage people to start their career in that subject. And I think for that, we need role models. We need people who talk about their fascination for the embedded branch, who talk about the importance of engineering for our climate goals to reach sustainable, sustainable solutions and all of that. And I think that is one way maybe for the long term to get more people into that industry, to show what opportunities you have, uh, to show that you really have impact, that you have the opportunity to work with people from around the globe, and that you're really in a position to drive uh, the, the future and to uh, really uh, bring your whole self into what you're doing every day. And I think that is one way to uh, yeah, tackle that in the future. Thanks. So at Infineon, uh, we are running different initiatives, um, talking about this long-term uh, approach. Um, so first of all, we have set us an ambitious goal to hire 25% um, of the, or to fill 25% of our uh, positions with graduates. So how do we do this? Um, First of all, in my opinion, you really need to start in the very beginning of the education. And um, this means already in the kindergarten, because in, in the kindergarten, a lot of reports and researchers has shown um, boys and girls in general have the same interest yeah, in technical things. Yeah? But then on the way to uh, university or vocational training, it really <laughs> uh, decreases a lot. So, for instance, we have one initiative called Wissensfabrik uh, Mint Minis. Um, this means um, um, employees of Infineon, they go to the kindergarten with experiments and with some boxes, and they can play with these things, you know, to get used to it. Then this famous Girls' Day or Boys' Day that is um, offered during school uh, is also one initiative. And later on, during university, it's um, also, or there's also one uh, thing that we are driving. It's called Invent a Chip. Here in Germany, it's a competition to design a chip. And then you're nominated and get a prize also if you win this competition. And um, there are also other things what we can do. So um, as you mentioned, um, employees can join um, a lecture at the university to talk about some technical um, trends, yeah, or what is like the research about, or they we can offer internships, yeah, or working student positions. So we're also offering um, corporations with universities like in Munich or in Dresden or other um, technical universities in uh, Germany, Europe, or globally. For instance, for PhD corporations, yeah, that um, talented graduates um, can work and, and pursue their PhD within Infineon you know, or like in a company. So there you have also a very good supply chain um, for, for the graduates and the talents. And then there you can also implement like international graduate programs. This means like traineeships. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or at Infineon, we offer um, an MBA program. It's called Collège d'Ingenieurs. So it's uh, Paris and Turin University and Munich um, for talented uh, STEM graduates. And so you can see there's a huge bunch of different things. Uh, and uh, it's all about to really start best yesterday, but uh, latest now to really encourage, um, to delight, and uh, make a greater enthusiasm for pupils already in the school. 
Um, in France, um, of course, uh, we are doing also a lot of effort and uh, uh, made me smile because you said in a kinder uh, kindergarten, but uh, you are right. Uh, you know, my, my son, at uh, three years old, when he went to the kindergarten the first day, he came home and said, Mom, am I a girl or a boy? If you are a boy, what a question. But I have long hair, and uh, the girls told, thought that I was a girl. And the, it's not about the hair. <laughs> so, um, and the, uh, but they, they are doing things in the kindergarten. For example, they put questions. What, uh, what, uh, which one of these activities are for boys, for girls, or for the both of them? And you have running, for example, and you have, and for, for fighting, and uh, uh, my son were, uh, had a few of them that for was really for the girls, you know, playing with a, um, a doll. It was for the girls, and um, and you have to explain. But it's a uh, it's a very good way that allowed parents uh, and uh, and the um, educators in the uh, kindergarten to to show them what. Uh, and what we do a lot is that uh, uh, women, um, uh, like uh, uh, entrepreneurs or uh, researchers, go in the in the high school or the college and uh, talk about their experience, as you are saying, and show uh, to the girls that uh, it's um, uh, it's definitely a, a way that ca they can see for them too. Uh, at a higher level, we have all those, for example, you can do a round table in, uh, in France without having a woman uh, uh, inside. We have two today, so <laughs> bravo. And, um, but, uh, and there you, you can see that you have even uh, women who are not aware of this. And uh, they are saying, oh, come on, um, this, is, uh, this is not an issue. Why do why forcing a girl? If, uh, if the uh, most skilled person in this area are men, so they are men. You invite free men. What, uh, what's the importance of the? But uh, it's uh, step by step and uh, with the examples and with, uh, uh, for example, France, um, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron president was in, um, uh, in China, I think, with a lot of entrepreneurs, 40 of them, and you have the photo on the, and there is no woman in that photo, okay. only guys, and and it was shocking for everyone, and uh, and you realize that now a little girl will see that, that this is a man's world, uh, so at yeah. all the levels, yes, it. Um, so yeah, that that is a tough one. Um, just as an anecdote, I guess I have taught in Tunisia, and I have some PhD students then from Tunisia, and I was surprised to see that over there, the ratio was the other way around. So they had like 80% women in computer engineering, 20% male. So maybe we should look at what they are doing differently. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, maybe a place for, 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 for us to, heart, to, to look for talent. Um, yeah, but, uh, let me add one, one thing, because I think especially in Germany, we have so many stereotypes and really outdated role models. And uh, it, it starts in kindergarten, but it starts even before when like mothers want to come back to work. Like, for example, one year after birth, it is almost impossible because there's no childcare. There are colleagues who point on you. And uh, so there's also a lot to do like what, what, tech, what uh, has to be done by the whole society and by, by everyone that we're more inclusive in that way as well. Yeah, definitely. So I think we have like five minutes. Uh, I don't want to take you off the opportunity to ask questions. If anybody has a question, concern. Yes, please. So I guess we have to. Yeah, I have one question uh, in the world nowadays, like everyone wants to do something meaningful. And I mean, I feel like the same that I want to do something on my own, like creating a startup. And I feel like, or I want your opinion on what you think, if that causes actually a problem, like everyone wants to do their own thing and not work for other companies anymore, or at least the trend towards this is going upwards. So I'm wondering that also causes some problems in that regard. So, so that, that, that's a good question, right? Um, so I'll let the panelists take the, take the question first. Um, 
I think if you have, uh, if you've been in the area and you see that um, you are coming with an uh, idea, bringing something that it's missing, you should go ahead. If it's for doing just for doing your own business, I don't know if it's a product and if it's gonna work. <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, for for example, uh, people uh, at the end of their studies, I would say if you want to do a startup, first join one. Uh, just to see how it functions, because it's uh, different for from school. It's different from a, a company that exists for uh, a lot of time. But if you really have a good idea, and yeah, you should go ahead. I mean, the most important thing is about that you are passionate about something, yeah? and then you can succeed. Um, as you mentioned, um, it's always kind of. Uh, valid yeah that you gather some uh, experiences also working in an in a, in a company startup or other companies but right away also from the university feel like really passionate and that's that's a key factor that also we are striving for higher that someone is like really into a topic like really motivated yeah and wants to drive something yeah so good luck I just uh, wanted to add one more thing on that because I think it's the duty of a team lead to create an environment where everyone bring his or her passion and really go for what is the uh, yeah most interesting thing for his or her. I think you don't have to be like self-employed or be a founder to go after what you really love. So this is the point I wanted to to make. Okay, awesome. There, there was another question over there. Hey, okay. I would like to ask you, is there any other way to assess talent besides from grades at school or university? So, to, to assess talent. So I guess we, we had that before, right? Like how to, uh, without not, just not looking at the grades. And I think some of you said, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's gut feeling, it's nose factor, it's interview, it's, uh, but yeah, maybe you can extend uh, on that. We, we have a, uh, a guy working for us, like um, from uh, London, uh, that didn't graduate. Uh, grades wasn't his uh, best, uh, but uh, he's a geek and he called like uh, no one does. So uh, we took him like for service, you know, uh, and he's full time on our project. So, uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, if you have the opportunity to show your skills, uh, the grades shouldn't be. Uh, um, uh, so in my experience, it's depending on the field of work. Yeah. So for instance, when I was talking to one of my managers and he said to me, okay, my best employee, most passionate, he's like really driving all the topics. It's in software en uh, engineering and he doesn't have any degree. He just uh, obtained everything by self-learning, but he's so talented and skilled. So there's no um, degree needed. but. In other professions, there is a degree needed at least to have a baseline. You know? yeah. It's really depending on the subject. Just the degree, not the grade, or, or also the grade to this degree. I think the, or, grades, are, I think the grades are never an issue. Uh, if you have your diploma, I, I, I don't know the grades, my guys had. <laughs> I, I do, I do. <laughs> Maybe if you want to become a professor, then you should be, <laughs> you should be quite good. So I think uh, our, our time is off, right? Uh, so I'd like, uh, thank you everybody for, for staying uh, so long and for being here. I'd like um, all of us to thank the panelists for their input. Yeah, have a great uh, rest of the evening. <laughs>